In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. As we recently read through the Gospel of Luke, one of the themes that we reflected upon was the coming of the Kingdom of God. And we reflected on the fact that in the expectation of the people of Israel, that would be marked by three things. First, the people would return from exile, and God would be their king. Secondly, true worship would be re-established, the temple cleansed, and sacri true and holy sacrifice offered to the one true God. And thirdly, that all the nations would come and recognize the Lord as God, and that they would be judged for what, how they had treated the people of Israel. And in a very mysterious way, because I'm sure it's not by design, but these first three preparatory Sundays for Great Lent, in fact, reflect these three different themes. Last Sunday, we heard about the one who returns from exile, the one who comes back to his father's house and acknowledges the fact that there is where the blessings are. If only he had remained near to his father, then he wouldn't have suffered as he did. He wouldn't have experienced the hardship of exile, of alienation. And in fact, in the parable that we heard of the prodigal son, we also heard of the elder brother though at home had exiled himself, had alienated himself into a field nearby the house perhaps, but just as far away in his heart from his father. And the gospel message was about return, about return to the father's home, an acknowledgement of the father and the blessings that come from him. And the week before we heard about really the restitution of true worship, because it was a temple parable, a temple story of the Pharisee on the one hand and the tax collector on the other. The Pharisee who had all the prayers down pat, the spiritual life organized and set out just so, living a righteous life, yet without, without the heart, without the true repentance and contrite heart, the broken heart that lies at the heart of true worship. And when joined with the prayer of the tax collector, that completes the picture of true worship, the acknowledgement of the true God, but in humility, in brokenheartedness. And this morning, of course, we have this famous story, this telling of the judgment, of the separation of the sheep from the goats when the Son of Man comes in his glory. And it says in this in the words of the Lord, that all the nations will be set before. Note, not as a, in our popular art and imagination, every individual person, but the nations. Why the nations? Ethni in Greek. Because this is precisely what the Jewish people, the people of Israel, expected to happen when the kingdom of God would be established, when God would return and put things to rights, Indeed, the nations would be called to account. We hear this in the prophecy of Daniel when it talks about after all the great empires and the beasts have passed, the Son of Man will come and the judgment will be meted out. We hear of this in the book of the prophet Ezekiel as well, where this imagery of the sheep is taken up again and again. The Lord is the shepherd and he will call his sheep, even those who were suffering even those who were oppressed, and they will be delivered from the mouths of the beasts. But above all, the Lord's words in this morning's gospel actually reflect a very late book amongst the Jewish people. It's the, the book of Enoch, which is not in any of the canonical scriptures. But there is exactly this story told, where the Son of Man comes seated in glory, accompanied by his angels, and the nations of the world will be arrayed before him and they will be separated into the righteous and the unrighteous. 
and they will be judged for this, for the way they treated God's people. And the expectation in Enoch is that God's people are the Jews. And all the nations, whether the Romans or the Greeks or the Babylonians or the Assyrians or all those empires which had risen over time and had oppressed the people, who had caused them to go into exile, who had defiled the temple, who had set up over the people of Israel both foreign rulers and powers and obstacles to their true worship, all of them would be judged for the way they treated God's own people. That's the way the story is told. That's the expectation of what will happen when God comes and sets up the Son of Man to judge the heavens and the earth. Well, it doesn't quite work out that way in the way Jesus tells that exact same story. In the first instance, he talks not just about sheep, but sheep and goats. And that's an interesting one because it draws, obviously, on the experience of everyday life. Every day, a shepherd and a goat herd, I presume, would separate the sheep from the goats because they would graze the fields in the same fields by day. But at night, they needed to be separated. The goats needed more care. They don't withstand the cold as well. They needed to be kept in a warm place. So you would separate sheep from goats at the end of every day. Not just at the end of time, at the end of every day. And so this is familiar to the people that Jesus is speaking to. But more significantly, of course, is that when he gets to the part about how they are to be judged, how they are to be separated, the righteous from the unrighteous, it is not on the basis of how they treated Israel, but on the basis of how they treated the people with whom God himself identifies, which, of course, was expected to be Israel. But here isn't. Here, it's the least of my brethren. Here, it's the poor, the lonely, the outcast, the hungry, the thirsty, the imprisoned. And in the first instance, this, of course, refers to those poor ones, those little ones, the least of his brethren, the new people of Israel gathered around Christ, that is to say, the apostles and their disciples. That's what this is about. And if you situate this in the gospel where it's told, it is, of course, primarily about the events of what are about to unfold. This is the very last teaching our Lord gives before his entrance into Jerusalem, before his passion, his death, and his eventual resurrection. And there are two chapters of what are called apocalyptic tellings or stories or sayings. Apocalypse means in the Greek to reveal, to, to unveil, to open up, to tell a mystery which until now had been hidden. And of course, in our contemporary reading of all this, we push this all off to somehow the end of time as though none of this has happened. But that's not what our Lord is talking about in the first instance. When the Son of Man comes and is glorified, when the Son of Man comes and, and the temple is, is cast down and a new temple is brought up in the resurrection, these are the events of the passion and the death and the resurrection of Christ. He says over and over in these stories, some of you here will not die before you see this. So of course this isn't some distant time in the future. This is precisely what's about to unfold. The Romans are coming, and they're coming hard. And they will disperse this nation. And they will destroy the temple. And moreover, the Son of Man will have been glorified by hanging on a tree. By his death will he manifest himself. Those three expectations of the people of Israel, that God would come and restore his people from exile and reign as king, the true worship would be reestablished and the nations would be judged. They happened. They happened when Christ hung from the cross. That's what the Gospels tell us over and over, yet we don't see it. We somehow like to push this off 
Let's have this interim space where we can get on with our business, our ordinary life. Later, we'll worry about these things. But exactly now, as our Lord goes to suffer his death and resurrection, he says, this is what's going to happen. The nations of the world will be gathered and judged because the Son of Man will be seated in glory on the cross. And that cross now becomes the, the crisis point, the dividing point, the central point of all human history. It's in light of the cross that all are separated into the righteous and the unrighteous. It's in light of the cross, in the face of the cross, that all the nations stand judged. And God's poor ones, the marginalized, the ones that God identifies with, they will be exalted through the cross. And if you look hard back at the scriptures, in the prophets, you'll see none of this is actually new. God always identified with the poor ones. God always identified with the outcast. God always reigned as king, and the true worship always existed, written in the covenant of the heart. And that is what Christ reveals to us. And note that even after his resurrection, as he's with his disciples, they still don't get it. He opens to them the scriptures and shows them that this is the way it always was. Could you not see? And only then do they get it. Only then do they understand what the scriptures had been saying all along about the true Israel, the true manifestation of God as king of heaven and earth, the true worship of him. It's not about land and earthly king and earthly judgment of the nations, but about a central point in history on the cross through which all of these things have come to pass. And they continue because we continue to live in that moment. And every part of our lives stands judged, not some distant time, but now. The last judgment is already and now and here in our hearts, in our lives. And every time we stand face to face with Christ, then all of that is revealed to us. The apocalypse takes place, this revelation, this unveiling of the truth. If we are to receive the kingdom of God, then we must understand this. There isn't just ordinary time, ordinary life, the time of our lives where we get busy doing things, and then sometime we'll carve out part of our lives to attend to some spiritual reality that will come into play later. No, every moment and every aspect of our life stands now in light of the cross. The Son of Man enthroned on the cross, surrounded by the holy angels, before whom all the nations are judged by the way they behave and approach Christ himself, who is most known in the weak, in the vulnerable, in the outcast, where there is pain, where there is suffering, where there is darkness, where there is despair, there the light of Christ shines, there the Lord of glory is enthroned. And there we, if we are to be called Christians, if we are to be called after his name, in Christed by our baptism, by our chrismation, then we too must go and we too must minister. Because if in the first instance our Lord means those who follow him are the poor ones, are the weak ones. He means also that for all time we must also be the ones ministering as he does. And so we are both Christ as minister, as minister too. This is the true meaning of this Sunday of the judgment. And it fits perfectly into this preparatory period where we see the return from exile, the acknowledgement of the Father as the place where all blessings are to be found, 
where we acknowledge true worship as the broken heart which offers a, a humble prayer of repentance and cry of Lord have mercy or literally in the words of the tax collectors we heard Lord you do the sacrifice for me I can't do this and this is truly the acknowledgement of the judgment which accrues from the cross of Christ from his death on behalf of all who suffer all the, the ones in pain in misery in despair that is what the Sunday of judgment is all about and of course this continues and of course there will be a final moment when God's true kingship and the true worship and the true judgment will indeed be revealed for all to see the ultimate as it were apocalypse revelation of what is already true for us now but that should not surprise us that should not take us unawares because already those of us here today celebrating the divine liturgy and coming face to face with Christ and partaking of his divine body and blood already we've experienced the end already we've come face to face with that there will be no surprise Lord when because we've already experienced that here and now as we gather together in this sacred and holy service surrounded by the angels with the Lord enthroned on his cross let us as we go forward into this holy season not forget what has already been revealed to us that already we know our true homes already we know what is true worship already we experience the true judgment on the basis of the one who is Lord and King Lord of glory enthroned in his cross unto the ages Amen. <laughs>